Frank Herbert's Dune is not really liked in Christian circles, and for good reasons. It depicts faith and religion in an edgy teenager manner, as shallow superstition and a way to control and hold power over people. But that doesn't mean there is no meaning for us to explore and profound symbolism to be found in it, including the newest installment of Denis Villeneuve's screen adaptation. A couple of disclaimers before we start. One, I assume you've either already watched Dune Part 2 or are not going to, so spoilers ahead. Two, since this is a Symbolic World spin-off channel, I am not going to explain the basic framework of symbolic analysis as you are most likely already familiar with it. Let's begin. Dune, symbol by symbol, part 2. Our first focus point will be the planet Arrakis itself, as it quite nicely represents the fractality of a single pattern. On one level, Dune, as a whole, is a realm of wilderness, beyond the hierarchy of the civilized universe, where demons and dragons roam freely, where almost certain death awaits you. But there is also a slim chance of obtaining enormous riches. But we can zoom in to the planet's surface and see the same pattern repeated. There are rocky formations and plateaus where towns and sieges are located, which are relatively much safer, but of no interest otherwise, while the true potential lies in the open desert, the worm territory. In this movie, we are introduced to a new middle level of the same pattern, the division between the north and the south of the planet. The north has been largely tamed by the Harkonnen. Yes, the worms, the heat and the lack of moisture are still there, but they figure out a way how to deal with all that and harvest the riches effectively. However, it is the south of Arrakis where true potential, the desert power, lies. Turning a blind eye to its existence, constant pushing it away from their consciousness and focus, turns out, as always, to be Harkonnen's downfall. The southern hemisphere is a realm of such extremes, of such extremism, that it has the potential to topple the whole empire. South of Arrakis is the stumbling stone for the galactical hierarchy. The pattern of the stumbling stone becoming the cornerstone of a new hierarchy is also fractally scalable. It could be the Atreides, the south of Dune, Paul himself, his potential to lead the Fremen, etc. Everything whose existence was not properly acknowledged and was pushed away beyond the margins while having enough covert potentiality. So far so good, but there are a few aspects of the story that make it a bit more ambiguous and complex. First, is that back in the previous movie, Baron Vladimir Harkonnen seemed to have, to some extent, respected the existence of the margin by not killing Jessica and Paul directly, even though it was technically within his power. The second aspect of the same situation is that we learn in this movie that Jessica is Baron's daughter and Paul his grandson. What's more, upon discovering this fact, our freshly enlightened Mahdi realizes that this is how we're going to survive, by becoming her Conan. All this may lead us to a conclusion that a lot has to change for things to stay the same, and that the old hierarchy has not been toppled, but rather, the cycle continues as it was supposed to. Even more so, the Baron, in a way, prepared his grandson to inherit the throne. 
If you are familiar with the extended Star Wars universe, you can find a similar idea formulated in the Sith Rule of Two, where the master is responsible for training an apprentice that inevitably leads to his own doom at the hands of his minion. But let's get back to Paul. For the Fremen, he is also a stumbling stone, a Lisan al Gaib, a voice from another world, an element outside of the hierarchy that becomes its new cornerstone. The religious aspect of the situation, despite those comedic throwbacks to Monty Python's Life of Brian, is not as unambiguous as Herbert might have intended. Paul Muad'Dib is not an ordinary boy pushed around by mere circumstances after all. He sees the future and the past and, not unlike Eren in Attack on Titan, decides that genocide is the best if not the only way forward. It is also a bit of a shorthand on the part of both writers, but let's suspend our disbelief for now. Why do I say that watching Dune is worthwhile for us? Because it's an honest story and an honest movie. It helps to understand how Jesus actually breaks the cycle and establishes a truly new hierarchy. In other words, imagine the Fremen as Israelites getting exactly the Messiah they were expecting. We can see that the salvation brought by such a figure is only death and continuation of a vicious Harkonnen on the throne. The movie is not trying to lure the viewer into thinking that the ending is a happy one, as Paul's send them to paradise line is hardly any different than Baron's kill or Fremen order. The cycle of revolutions continues. There was a glimpse of the self-sacrifice pattern in Paul during the duel with Fade Rotha, but it's quickly gone and the original pattern plays itself out to the end. I think it's worth asking, what would be a Christian thing to do in a situation like Paul's? Is taking back Arrakis a just war? And if so, how to avoid becoming a flood, wiping out everything in its way and risking the same type of backlash later? To what point is the retribution justified and how to contain it? I hope you can help me in the comments. I'd like to finish this video with another symbol that isn't easy but might be a good key to understanding the whole story. That symbol is the ooze produced by a dying sandworm being drowned in water. The ooze, quite subversely, called the water of life. To understand its meaning we need to move back to my previous video about Dune, where we explored what a sandworm is. Just for a short recap, the worms of Arrakis, as a collective, are a deity, Shei Hulud, the maker of Spice Melange, but a Shei Tan, the reason behind Dune being Abaddon, Sheol, hell, as it is the sandworm that is responsible for creating the desert landscape on Arrakis. In the context of the book, water is exclusively a symbol of life, rather than chaos and instability. The sandworm does not tolerate any amount of water. It finds it quite deadly. Some knowledge of Milton's Paradise Lost might come in handy here. It is indeed Satan who does not tolerate any amount of light, any amount of life. Water in Dune is like the eternal fire of Christ, invigorating for some, lethal for others. In the same way, water is life-giving for the Fremen, but deadly for Shaitan 
the serpent. Then we need to try to understand what is the meaning of this final excretion of a drowning worm. We could look for a parallel in Christ dying on the cross. His final words, his final breaths, are his testament, his ultimate will. In the same way, the final will of a dying serpent takes the form of a poison that gives its drinker, that's right, knowledge of things future and past. In this way, while I suggested in one of my shorts that Jessica and Paul fulfill the trope of the mother and the son in the first installment, here in part two, Jessica becomes an anti-Mary by fulfilling the will of the dragon. This symbolism seems to be much more pronounced in the movie, as in the book it wasn't exactly so. After drinking the poison, she starts urging Paul to do the same. Of course she would. And so eventually he drinks it as well. And this way his visions become clear. His eyes are opened, you could say. And he learns about things future and past, of good and evil. The rest is history. I believe that such reading of the Water of Life symbol might open up the whole story in Dune 2 for you. Please let me know in the comments if you agree or if you see it differently. Thank you for watching and until next time.